Well, here we are again. I thought I was finished with She-Hulk Attorney at Law and its terrible terribleness, but just when I thought I was out, she pulled me back in and took Daredevil with me. There have been four more episodes since I, you know, said maybe some not so nice things about the series, how it clearly wasn't for me. It wasn't funny. It's too non-committal to its storylines and themes. The writing's bad, you know, yada, yada, yada. I have a whole breakdown on that you can just revisit on your own time. I was more or less going to jump ship entirely, and honestly, I would have, if not for the unending promise of some Matt Murdock action. So, frankly, like a goddamn idiot, I tuned in week after goddamn week, and each time I tuned in, Daredevil didn't show up. And that's fine, you know what? I, I get it, it's a She-Hulk show, it's not a Daredevil show. <laughs> Joke's on me, right? No, seriously, it really is. It was my fault. I'm the, I'm the idiot. And anyone complaining about Daredevil not being in the show, I mean, it's you're watching a She-Hulk show. Come on. Well, this week, we finally got the episode. After being baited for weeks, mocked by the series, for tuning in to watch something they promised to us, something that was used as a hook in their marketing, something they kept promising. I mean, Jesus, like going to a strip club and having the stripper make fun of you for being there, and it's like, Look, we we both know why we're here. I hated that. Just don't put Daredevil in the marketing and we wouldn't have this problem. But finally, Daredevil and She-Hulk crossed paths and eh, yeah, it was fine. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and say it was the greatest thing I've ever seen in the MCU, or that it was complete dog shit, because truthfully, neither of those are really true. It has some pretty good stuff in it, arguably the strongest couple of scenes in the entire series so far. I mean, this is honestly probably the best episode in the entire series so far. But it also features Daredevil's MCUification to an extent, where they place him into some of this cringe comedy, and they're a little bit too wink-wink at the camera with everything that kind of involves this guy and they're winking at the camera perhaps a bit too much. So overall, there was promise here. Some of it worked, some of it maybe could have been a bit better, but Daredevil is officially in the MCU. And holy shit, would you look at that? It's Ridge Wallet. Back when I was the dumbass who carried around a bulky, floppy dad wallet, I had to stop coins from falling out all the time. My card slots were always a disorganized mess, and sometimes the thing wouldn't even be able to squeeze into my pocket to begin with. And worst of all, it would leave my cash and cards vulnerable to theft and even RFID hacking. Luckily, Luckily, the Ridge Wallet came to the rescue, giving my belongings the protection they deserve. I love the fact that I can hold up to 12 cards in it, plus room to carry around some dollar bills, which are very useful whenever I need to make it rain. What, who am I kidding? I'm not doing that. I'm not... <laughs> I don't have endless flows of cash. Who's Who wrote this? Jeez. The wide range of over 30 designs means that I can make my wallet speak to my personality and its RFID blocking security features make it as strong as a Hulk. Seriously, guys, Ridge is one of the best wallet companies out there. I've been using them for a while, even before they've sponsored on the channel. And if nothing else, it's just kind of a cool party trick to pull out this sleek looking wallet. Like, look at this. Oh, gosh, it just looks so good. You pull it out, you pay for your drinks at the bar, and you go on your merry way while Everyone's looking at you like, damn, look at that slick piece of metal. So what are you waiting for? Go at supersonic speed to Ridge's site using my link, ridge.com slash filmspeak, or the code filmspeak for 10% off your purchase. That's ridge.com slash filmspeak, or the code filmspeak for 10% off your purchase. And thank you so much to Ridge for sponsoring this video. This episode starts off with a bang, or a ribbit, I might add, with She-Hulk representing everyone's favorite MCU hero, Leapfrog. Complete with this catchphrase, Time to rib it She's representing Leapfrog against Luke Jacobson, who we were introduced to a couple of episodes back, a manufacturer of superhero suits, including Jens. And, you know, we also saw that Daredevil helmet that cameoed a few weeks back, too. But this is all happening because Leapfrog's suit malfunctioned. And who's representing Jacobson other than, hold for applause, Matt Murdock himself. Yeah, that was essentially what it was like when he entered the courtroom. Everyone's waiting for Matt. He's gonna take the spotlight and run with it. At least it was nice of the show to not bury the lead after three straight weeks of empty promises. Anyway, though, Jen is demanding that Jacobson make his client list public so she can see if other clients have had faulty suits. Matt motions to reject that because it's not relevant to the litigation, and oh my god, is this legal comedy actually turning into an actual lawyer show for once? I, I just... This is a miracle. And to be fair, because like a properly just legal system, if films because one thing, we're fair, some of the implications this case makes about superheroes, about the you in the MCU, are interesting ideas. And the way Jen and Matt interact is actually pretty great. Jen believes there could be other incidents of clients sustaining injuries due to faulty merchandise, and thus the info is relevant. Matt retorts that Jacobson's record when it comes to customer satisfaction is spotless. And Jen comes back with, well, if they have nothing to hide, then why not? 
not make it available? Matt says it's a gross invasion of people's privacy based on a very shaky what if, and you start to get the sense that Matt is representing Jacobson to protect his anonymity and subsequently the well-being of those he loves and others like him. The people close to them didn't ask to be part of this life. It's honestly a pretty great dissection of how both Matt and Jen view being a superhero and how they view superhero rights prior to any further interactions between the two. After all, as Matt says, they're not just talking about any product. Jacobson makes suits exclusively for superheroes, and the very nature of his work necessitates anonymity. This interaction helps deepen the world Daredevil and She-Hulk and all the rest of these characters live in, and for my money, I'd actually argue this is a better version of what they wanted from Civil War because you actually have an anonymous hero and a public figure. Their worldviews line up with who they are and how they carry themselves as a hero and lawyer and are beautifully articulated. That's interesting, and it's by far the best scene in the entire episode. Jen, however, seems to shrug off the need for for anonymity. Superheroes operate in the public eye, she says. As superheroes, it is assumed that there will be some loss of privacy. She's making it personal because of how sensationalized her case is. If she can't have anonymity, then why should other supers? This is the way that it is, right? It's part of the gig, whether they like it or not. Her dealing with celebrity, with being a public superhero lawyer, basically comes to a head here. Her experience is all she really knows, and it's not been a great one so far. And she's a bit naive as to how the larger game works. Jen chose to make her identity public, but it isn't up to her to choose for everyone else. And I just love this exchange. I love that Matt is the one to inform us of the state of the Sokovia Accords, hearkening back to his role in the Civil War comic. Similar to Cap, he's always been a guy who's been willing to put ethics, morals, helping the every person, the little guy, what's right, ahead of all else. But I have to admit, hearing that the Sokovia Accords were dissolved as a matter-of-fact kind of line is a bit cheap. Like, they just needed to throw that in there for the sake of the debate, which is fine. Part of me likes that things like this just happen in the world and you don't have to draw attention to them, but this is the Sokovia Accords. You'd think that would have been a far more monumental issue to explore if it was repealed. I do like that one line about how this whole thing could put Jacobson and his clients in a lot of danger, all because of one man's misuse of a suit. This is such a great line because it really speaks to the larger ramifications of Tony's actions in Civil War. Matt's jab isn't just at Jen's doofus elitist client who poured the wrong fuel into his boosters, it's also pointing towards Tony and his flaws. Just because one guy makes a decision to do something and it doesn't pan out the way they think doesn't mean they need to change things for everyone as a means of penance. It's self-righteous. I also think at times Matt sounds like he's speaking to protect everyone else, but he also sounds weirdly selfish here. The way he talks about this, it's like he's doing all of this to cover his own ass, which is not necessarily the most Daredevil things. Like, Daredevil is a very selfless, caring guy. I mean, yeah, he's got his own set of issues, but I don't know. It's a dialogue exchange that probably should have been picked apart a bit more before it was put on screen, but it's not an unwelcome scene overall, and it's honestly the best and my favorite scene of the entire show so far. I realize that's a very low bar given the competition, but Come on, I'm trying to be fair here, remember? Also, while I thankfully feel Cox's Daredevil is mostly consistent with who he was in the Netflix series, the quality of Cox almost highlights how painfully mediocre the rest of She-Hulk Sans Maslany really is. He clearly suffers a bit due to the show's pedestrian writing and directing. For every line that he delivers with his usual conviction, the little hold for applause, hold for laughs asides with a smirk are just a bit off. They're trying to draw too much attention to themselves. Like, the whole don't ask me how I know, I just know line, when he points out the prosecution is lying, is a bit cheap. And it's especially cheap when Cox is clearly smirking and winking at the audience. It's not cute, it's not funny, it's just a bit eye-rolling, and it's made worse by the fact that the show is trying to tell me it's funny. Comedies that directly tell you what to laugh at are just not my thing. They're kind of the lowest common denominator, and this thing is a laugh track away from being insufferable in that regard. I almost wish there was a laugh track, because then at least we'd know that we're watching a proper sitcom. And that whole courtroom scene in totality plays like Jen trying to win in order to force Jacobson back to her, trying to get one over on him instead of doing the right thing. She's definitely selfishly motivated here, and it shows in contrast to Matt's unwavering hand. Yeah, Matt comes off a bit selfish too, 
too, but I don't think that's intentional. I think it's just rocky writing and using Sokovia as the battleground for his argument just feels messy because of all the baggage attached to that event. But Matt and Jen sharing a drink after the case is really nice and feels more like real people who have disagreements letting their guard down after the arguing is done. It's great that Matt brings up how he exclusively runs his practice in Hell's Kitchen doing pro bono work just because it's the right thing to do. It helps people. It's for us. And when the bills start piling up, he can take a trip to LA and work on something like the dumbass leapfrog case. He's perfected the duality of his life, which makes him a great pseudo mentor to help Jen with her struggle. Jen is constantly working for the suits, the white collars, the elite full time, and doesn't have any gas in the tank for anyone else. That's pretty interesting because at the beginning of the show, Jen was really hell bent on trying to do the right thing, on trying to help people as a lawyer, not as a superhero. And we all see how that kind of went by the wayside when she joined the superhuman law division. She kind of lost her way a bit. And this idea is really interesting to chew on because it speaks to those stuck in the ethical dilemma of corporate America. They want to climb the ladder, make money, be successful, but it comes at the cost of who they are, their morals, and their ethics. Jen didn't even want to take the stupid frog case, but had to because of the rich kid with rich parents paying the firm's bills. As a superhero and a lawyer, she's in a unique position to do good. As Matt says, Jen Walters can use the law to help people when society fails him. And she hulk can help people when the law fails him. That's the balancing act Jen must perfect. The same act that Matt has managed to. Jen can, if she chooses to, be the best of both worlds. This whole exchange feels like it's the first time since Bruce in episode one where someone is talking to Jen like a person. That's because, <laughs> truthfully, it is the first time since then. Instead of some beefcake lusting over She-Hulk and then ditching Jen in her human form, or a so-called nice guy who claims to like Jen for who she is only to blackmail her for the incel Hulk King, Matt is the first person to see Jen as she truly is, to accept the super and the alter ego, to see the beauty and value each half of Jen's whole has to offer. Following a string of bad dates, tools, incels, douchebags, it's nice to see Jen feel good about herself, to see someone appreciate her for who she is. I love that this connection doesn't come through an app or a bitchy friend's wedding. It's spontaneous. It comes to her when she least expected it, and of all places, in a place of law and order, the domain and ethics she holds near and dear to her heart. Matt reminds her of why she became a lawyer in the first place and the incredible opportunity she has to enact real justice. That's why Jen falls head over heels for Matt. Not because he's hot, he is by the way, or shows her attention or whatever, but because he sees deeply into her soul, admiring the very person she is. This creates such a genuine connection. Her and Matt feel like two people discovering a spark and you can see it all on screen. You feel it because Cox and Maslany are fucking incredible actors and the show is actually letting them act. And apropos to their chemistry and the clear respect Matt is showing her, Jen really wanted to stay with him before he had to leave. You could sense the yearning. Even Matt didn't really know what to say for one of the first times I think we've ever seen on screen. Which brings us to the final stretch of the episode where we get the gold devil. Daredevil has to intervene when Leapfrog kidnaps Jacobson and holds him hostage. It really felt like we were done with that storyline, but you know, the show can't help itself. And we obviously need to see Matt and Jen get into their superhero form and team up. As such, we get to experience such incredible lines like, My uh, ass remains unwhooped. Which... <sighs> Not even gonna go into it. And for anyone who thought the She-Hulk CGI was bad, oh boy, wait till you see CGI Daredevil getting unmasked by Jen. It looked like she was holding up a floating head here. Now, to be fair, Daredevil was probably a late addition, so there wasn't much room for practicality, and it's nice to see the classic Daredevil acrobatics, but man, I pray this is the first and last time we're forced to see rubber band Daredevil like this. I mean, the guy's just like moving all over the place. He's got like no bones, it's just like flimsy. If Daredevil Born Again knew what was good for them, they'd keep things practical. So after all that compromise, all that build up, does it work? Does Daredevil work in the MCU? Eh, yeah, 
mostly. I wasn't too thrilled when I first watched the episode, but upon rewatch, I've warmed up to it a bit, and it's kind of undeniable. It definitely feels like MCUified Daredevil, which is both exactly what I expected and, thankfully, not as terrible as I feared. But they're also channeling a lighter version of the character reminiscent of the 60s comics in a sexy, almost Batman Returns-esque superhero team-up. The tit-for-tat jabs on the job, Jen lusting over Matt hearing her heartbeat, a little vibrantly blue tip of the hat to the Man Without Fear's iconic Netflix hallway scenes, albeit with a significant dip in quality, but we'll just take what we can get here, I guess. I gotta say, it all put a smile on my face. A soft smile, but a smile nonetheless. In a meta sense, Daredevil pushing to go it alone, to fight the goons all stealthily and thwart the baddie his way, only for She-Hulk to She-Hulk smash her way into the building, disrupting his plan, is a nice reminder to the audience that, yes, while it's great to see Matt back and have him kick ass for a brief moment, this is ultimately still a She-Hulk show, and Jen's the one who gets the final word on how they complete the mission. I'm just as surprised as you to be saying this, but it's honestly a really fun tug and pull we've seen before in other sitcoms, where a beloved guest star would show up and try to steal the show from the lead only to be put in their place. Now, Matt isn't actively trying to do that, but you can tell the filmmakers are having a bit of fun with that idea, with the idea that everyone was waiting for Matt Murdock, and it's like, okay, look, you're gonna get mad, he's gonna have his little moment, but this is a She-Hulk show, so we gotta do things to service this character, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but they managed to pull off the balancing act great. And then... We get the steamiest moment of the MCU. After seeing each other for who they are, after Matt helps Jen to merge both the She-Hulk and her unique position as a lawyer into one incorruptible justice-purveying super lawyer, after they team up to take down the bad guy and save Luke Jacobson, the gradual buildup of attraction, their chemistry becomes a bit too undeniable, and let's just say it was time for a release in many senses of the word. Matt may have been a gentleman offering to take Jen to dinner the next time he's in town, but Jen needed this win. She wasn't going to let the first date, yes, this was undoubtedly a superhero first date, formalities get in the way of what she's been emotionally craving. She may have had to go through most of an entire season of television to find a genuinely good guy who didn't have ulterior motives, who saw her for her, who lives on the opposite side of the country, but goddamn, was it not only satisfying to see her win, but also see her with someone we all love and approve of. Also, if this isn't classic, horny, good Catholic boy Matt Murdock, then I don't know what is. Look, when it really comes down to it, I could nitpick some of the eye-rolling bits like my ass remains unwhooped, which I still fucking hate, and the Daredevil theme playing over him going, I'm Daredevil, duh, in a wink-wink at the audience way. It just feels like an SNL skit, and then, in the most insincere way, the writing makes a joke about his name and the yellow and red attire they put him in because, haha, oh my god, the original comic costume, oh my god, it's so cringe, it's so stupid, you look like ketchup and mustard. I mean, none of this is really new. The MCU has been mocking sincerity for years, and this is probably, actually not even probably, this is definitely one of the least egregious versions of it, and yeah, I get it, it's happening within the confines of a sitcom, but I'd be lying if I didn't groan just a bit. That being said, for the first time in this series, it actually felt like the showrunners managed to create a real situational comedy instead of bending the characters to fit the situations. They remained true to the characterization of Matt Murdock and finally used the backdrop of a courtroom procedural to place the characters in funny, awkward scenarios. Look, as far as MCU introductions or reintroductions go, Daredevil's proper intro into the MCU, yes, I know he has a cameo in No Way Home, but let's be real, it's just a tease, nothing more, is by and large the best we've gotten so far. It's leagues better than the Kingpin introduction in Hawkeye, which I didn't even necessarily hate, but whatever, or the Spider-Man villains in No Way Home. It's the Matt Murdock we know and love funneled through a slightly lighter tone and dropped into a run-of-the-mill network sitcom. It's not the greatest episode of MCU television I've ever seen, but it was fun enough, satisfying even, and easily the peak of what She-Hulk has to offer as a show. It's just kinda ironic how after all the teasing, all the, hey, this is my show, we don't need a guest star, Daredevil is exactly what She-Hulk needed in order to become the legal sitcom we all hoped it would be. It's just unfortunate that it took eight out of the nine episodes to get there, and Lord knows I don't have confidence in the finale. But the important thing is, though, Daredevil looks to be in safe hands in the MCU.